You made it, you're at church today. Who was here last week? Did you think you'd make it another week? You don't feel like Armageddon's coming anytime. Everybody put your fingers up like, I feel like we're closer. We're getting closer. Welcome to church, the best hour of your week. Love it that you're here, guys. We got a lot of people watching everywhere. Let's go through a few. The Alassie family in Missouri, how are you? We have 18 states and Canada watching right now. Uh, Christine in Florida, Christina in Michigan, Megan in Kentucky, Lisa in Illinois, Monica in PA. That is just, just checking. Uh, Dina in Virginia, Aaron in Mississippi. Lots of people watching everywhere. Let's do, let's, let's do a couple of things. Number one, let's make sure we're praying for our country, for sure praying for the people in Louisiana. At this moment, a Category 4, I guess it's a big-time Category 4 hurricane. Is it 16 years ago today was Katrina? So, boy, a lot of devastation could occur there. We need to be praying for Afghanistan, praying for everything that's happening there, praying for a lot of our people. Obviously, the elephant in the room is the COVID Delta variant is... I don't know why they named it Delta. I like flying Delta United, you know, just name it something else. But um, so many people are affected by that right now. So welcome to church. Thanks for watching online. Everybody here, give it up for everybody watching everywhere this morning. Good stuff. I see, my, my, I see some very special people, David and Wendy Schroeder. Stand up, David and Wendy, on the front row. They are a part of our online campus family from Murfreesboro. What's up? George, where's George from New York? George, stand up from New York. You guys stand up. What's up? Good to see you. What a world we live in, man. We have people watching everywhere, part of our church. It's amazing. Uh, one guy I'll throw out is Tony Newsom. I, I saw him at the football game last night. My, my son's team, the Smokey Bears, got beat by the Carter Hornets. Um, it, was a great, it was a great game. Great game for sure. Uh, they didn't throw my son the ball enough. That's why we lost. You know, every parent would say that. I mean, what do you say? Uh, it was a great game. I love it that we can get after it. It's especially Sevier County and Carter. They fight getting off the bus. So I love that. That was, it was a good, good time. But I saw a friend who, uh, his son is now going to college. Uh, he was on Mason's baseball team. And I said, Tony, hopefully you have a good Sunday. And he goes, man, I'll be watching. And I'm like, Tony, I wasn't aware you came to our church. He goes, I, I don't miss any Sunday. He watches the 930 and the 1115 service. And if you know Tony, he needs it. So everybody, give it up for Tony, everybody. What's up, Tony? I thought I'd shout you out. That's good. That's good. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 3. If you're visiting with us, and boy, we have a lot of people visiting we as a church are a little different. You probably already kind of felt that in this service. We teach and preach in sermon series. I like to do that. I don't use the word redundant. I would rather use the word reinforcement. We reinforce God's word, God's truth, the power of this hour. Do not ever underestimate its potential because this is needed in our lives. As we focus on the place that God has for us, for you and for me, uh, if we don't watch it, we find ourselves in a pit, in a dark place. Anybody there? Be honest. Anybody can wake up and turn on the news and 12 seconds later, you're there? Um, we do not focus on the promises of God. We focus on problems. And so I love it that this series, even though the title is a little churchy, I guess, um, I like that. I, th I think we all can see ourselves in that drama that you just saw. And give it up for Jeanette and Savannah. I mean, Jeanette is awesome. She wrote that. If we don't watch it, we don't communicate as husbands and wives. We don't communicate as families. And we can find ourselves in just a really dark place. We struggle with meaning in life. We struggle with, hey, our place in this world. Why do we even get up every morning? And I do think there is a cultural sermon that is bombarding us daily that is teaching some things and we're digesting some things that is really harmful to us. And I really believe this moment does matter. And I love this series. I believe God led us to this moment, to this series. And so I want to go to the song that you just heard. Some of you that are visiting with us, you're like, did I just hear a Lady Gaga song here in church? Lady Gaga, who knows the song, Bradley Cooper, 
the movie The Star is Born. Lou, how many Star is Borns have been made? Three. Did you know that? That's the third, the current one, which don't watch it. It's depressing. People are still asking me, what did you endorse last week? A week away. Who watched it? Anybody watch it? Was it good? Some of you are like, no, it's a musical. It's a bunch of kids singing Christian songs. It was good. But don't watch A Star is Born because that's very depressing. The character played by Bradley Cooper fits into this sermon perfect, had everything that the culture tells us we got to have to fill the void, and he cannot find meaning. And so this song, the reason I had Pam, by the way, Pam killed that song. Lady Gaga, eat your heart out. The reason I had Pam and Bradley Cooper, Scott, sing that song (laughs) is a lyric that I want you to pay attention to to jump into this week. That song is a powerful lyric because I think all of us are there. Tell me something, girl. Are you happy in this modern world? Mm. Or do you need more? Is there something else you're searching for? Everyone is there. Tell me something, boy, or aren't you, try, aren't you tired trying to fill that void? And really, the, the, the lyric that I'm after is, in all the good times, I find myself, must find myself still longing for change. But in the bad times, I fear myself. That's me. Even as a Christian, even, hey, God, you know what? I need you more today than yesterday. I want to be closer to you tomorrow, more tomorrow than today. If I don't watch it, I can consume so much culture just by, hey, social media, the news, that you're like, man, is there even any meaning? Why do I even do what I do? It seems like the world's going to hell. What are we even doing? The church should just shut the doors. We should just nail the door shut. I'll stay in here till the Lord comes. We're not going to make a difference, but yet people are lost. They're not happy in this modern world. We long for more. Even in the good times, we want more. I find myself all the time. Last week, case in point, my wife went to Nagano's, brought Nagano's home for dinner. Nagano's Japanese right there in between Pigeon Forge and Sevierville. Who's eating at Nagano's? Okay. Uh, It's like, uh, I'm eating the food. Dave, I find myself like, I could have probably had something better for dinner than this, even though the little yum-yum sauce is good. 7,000 calories per tablespoon, and you drizzle it all over the vegetables, right? I mean, I find myself that in the good times, I'm like, man, I I still can find something better. Some of you are married to her right now. You're like, yeah, it's good, but. uh." How about this? Case in point in the world we live in. Check this out. Ready? Has anybody seen your home value lately? Anybody like me, like, uh, I'll live at the church basement. I can live in the closet. It gets any higher, I'm moving. We're living in the car. <laughs> anybody felt like that? I mean, like, you look at your house, and a couple years ago when you bought that house or built that house, you're like, oh, this is the best thing ever. And now you're like, oh, man, it's worth that. I'm so tired of this bathroom. <laughs> That's us. We, we search for the latest and greatest. I wrote it this way, my sticky note. We have a God-shaped hole in all of us, and it's not money or power or relationships or even places that will ever fill it, but that's what we do. We search for it. Even as Christians, if we don't watch it, we're so into the culture. The culture teaches even the beginning of mankind is wrong. Even creation is wrong. We don't teach that anymore. We teach evolution, that we just evolved. I said it last week. Some Big bang happened. We all are from some cosmic tadpole. And people believe it. We're like, well, that's what science says. <gasps> so you believe science, huh? Science is rock solid lately. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I'm just... The government is the answer. Boy, they know what they're doing. <laughs> Great. They're probably watching. I mean, <laughs> please get me out of prison this week. I mean, we laugh, but people are like, well, okay. Yeah, that's what I believe. It's true. And if you believe that, I will say it, right? If you believe that, hey, we're all just, ha- it just, just happened. 
Like I said last week, and I thought it was good. It hit me, and I did it right away. I did it all services. I got some laughs for the people that are funny and some laughs for people that you don't have a sense of humor. But I jumped into everybody's working for the weekends. Well, if you believe that the world just happened, there's no meaning, well, then just keep a diaper on and keep eating Cheetos and stay in bed. I mean, that's what I, we might as well turn this into some widget factory. We can all work here. We can make something. And that's the world. If we don't watch it, our world teaches and preaches and screams at us. Well, there's not a lot of meaning. If you get the beginning wrong and you get the end wrong, like when you die, you just go to nothing. But yet you realize, there's, man, there's something that we long for. There is something that we search for. There is a God-shaped hole. If you look at creation and you don't think, wait a minute, there is a God who created all things. The earth happens to be like the perfect distance to the sun to sustain human life, and that just happened? If men came from apes, then why are there still apes? Let's go back to that thought from a long time ago. But yet people do. They believe it, and they think we're crazy to believe in creation. Oh, you're stupid. What? But that's our world. And so we all search for the place. How's it working in our modern world, y'all? We're all in a pit. It's all what we do. It's what our kids do. We, we're like robots. We do everything that everybody else does because everybody else does it. Well, we got to do that. I don't even think my kid likes soccer, but he's got to play it because everybody plays it. And you're like, Brent, what do you, I mean, that's our world. That's how we are. And if we don't watch it, forget any promise. And then that's the danger because now in the bad times, you start to Fear yourself. The alone Brent is the dangerous Brent. I can get into a dark place in a hurry. And the enemy can battle and the enemy does battle. And we're going to talk about a satanic attack on our society, on us today, that we underestimate. It goes back to the beginning. It goes back to creation. And we got to own some things so we can battle our way to victory. We have to. And this moment does matter. Because all of us are here, and and I'll case in point, I'll start it. Can anybody tell me what this is? Does anybody know what this particular picture is? Wow, you guys are, you're not the sharpest service so far because uh, first service, everybody screamed it. Voyager, Voyager. Do you realize in 1977, NASA launched Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 at the same time to explore the outer reaches of our galaxy. Who knew that? That in 1977, NASA launched twin spacecraft. Come on, raise your hands. Let's see, some sm- let's see the smart ones among us. Okay, boy, not as many. At last service, they all raised their hands. So all the college graduates were in the last service, I guess. I, I knew that, but I kind of forgot. But there's one thing I learned this last few weeks in thinking about this, this all. And I'm going to tell you now, what I'm going to tell you, this illustration is Sermon Gold. I did not know this, and maybe you didn't as well. On Voyager 1 and 2, that NASA's smart scientist put together a record. Some of y'all remember who owned records back in the day. They put together a 12-inch gold-plated record called The Sounds of the Earth, and they put them on both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Just in case, I'm not making this up, that if Voyager 1 or 2 got into the far ends of the galaxy and they met up with E.T., <laughs> and E.T. happened to have a record player. I am not, you can Google, I'm not making this up, that they could put this record on, record on and this would be kind of like a cultural capsule, a planet capsule of what our earth is like. Sounds of the earth. They put stuff like a heartbeat, just, just the sound of a heartbeat. ka Come on, do that with me. Ka-gun. Ka-gun. Y'all, y'all remember the movie Dirty Dancing, right? Ka-gun. Anyway, all right. Uh, they put like the sounds of nature and all kinds of things on this thing called the sounds of the earth. It was a little bit of a cultural capsule. So if an extraterrestrial heard it, they could understand what our culture and our world, our planet is like. That is the truth. They did that. So about 30 years goes by, and somebody asked the head of the creative science department at NASA, what did you put on the sounds of the earth, and why did you put what you put on that record? And the head of the uh, creative department of NASA, it was a woman, 
She said, we, we did some extensive research and there was one thing that I wanted to put last on this album and it was the last thing on this album. If an extraterrestrial would listen, they would listen to the Coventina movement, string quartet, number 13, NB flat major, opus 130 of a guy named Beethoven. That if an extraterrestrial had a record player, this is what they would hear to represent us as earthlings. that marinade. She's like, this is true, ready? She's like, uh, when I heard this, man, I thought, what a great piece of composition. It's beautiful, but yet it's sad. And check this out, this is interesting. She said, when I heard this Coventina movement, I did some research and I saw the original composition, the original score that Beethoven wrote this piece of music on, the original paper, and in the margin, handwritten in his own handwriting was a word in German that meant longing. And we, we kind of surmised that Beethoven, when you heard this piece of music, Joel, bring it up, let's kind of fill the rafters, wanted you to think longing. So this is good. Part of what we wanted to capture in Voyager, she said, was this great longing we feel as people. It's as if NASA scientists were saying to the rest of the universe, this is who and what we are as human beings, creatures of longing. And hidden in the basic introduction to who we are, there's an implicit question that we are wanting to ask to possible extraterrestrials. Do you feel this longing too? Or are we the only ones? It's crazy. How many people knew that record was on Voyager 1 and 2? Look at the geeks among us right there. That's amazing. Give yourselves a hand. So here you go. Ready? Check this out. I wrote this down this way. If we're honest, there are times in our lives we look around and we wonder, is this all there is? If we're honest, we struggle. It's hard for us to believe sometimes that there is a place for us. There's a purpose. There's a meaning. And I think it's really, it's really perfectly um, kind of brought out in this picture. A picture paints a thousand words. And Robertino was in the Wednesday service. Some of you know the local artist, Robertino, who paints for us, and he's just an icon in the community. I said, Robert, in the world in which we live, this should be your fall painting. Forget Mount Leconte or something pretty. Paint that. Put your name on the bottom. We'll all buy it. But that's how we feel. There's so many of us today that are just kind of keeping our head above water. And it's weird because our culture teaches us that the shallow end of life stays surfacy. Don't go down deep. Don't expose really what you feel. It's just easier and it's more convenient to stay surfacy, to stay shallow. But if we don't go a little bit deeper and really think of the meaning of life, we forget all that God has done and the light of Jesus Christ that he sent. That our place in this world is found in a God who loves us more than we love ourselves. And so last week, to recap, I told you in Genesis 1 that God created all things. God created places and spaces for all of his creation, and we are the crowning jewel of his creation. We have a free choice. We have a soul. We are made in the image of God. He created Adam. He created Eve, and they had a choice to honor God to honor creation, to honor the creator, and to say, you know what, God, with the free choice that we have, we will worship you. But they chose to not honor their place in creation. So something happened, and it's striking. It's amazing how many people walked out and said, Brent, I never really saw that before, but it is true. And you see the aftermath, the consequence of what they did with the free choice that they have and why we live in the world we live today. And all of us, and I entitled the message last week, all of us now chase the place to belong. 
Because Adam and Eve were given the Garden of Eden. They were given a real place. It was more than just physical. It was spiritual. They had a relationship with God and had a place to belong. But because they chose to walk away from God, here's what Genesis says. The Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which they had been taken. And from that moment, we've been chasing the place to belong. And from that moment, we have been longing for our place in the world. We are people of longing. NASA had it right. I asked some staff members this week, I walked into a few offices, just kind of what I'll do from time to time, put people on the spot and I'll say, hey, what do you long for? One of our older staff members, a gentleman, he'll remain nameless. He's on the front row down here to my left. His name is Jim. He plays guitar right up here. He won't mind. But he said, well, a lot of us will say, he's like, hey, Brent, man, you know, I love to reverse some regret. Anybody with any age will say that. All of us have made some poor choices. Aren't you thankful God's mercies are new every morning? So he went deep on me. I'm like, Jim, man, that's, he even threw it out, reversal of regret. I'm like, whoa. And then he stopped for a second. He goes, I long for a new pickup truck, too. But that, that was shallow. That was, that was like just boom, one to the other. Some of our staff said this, and I was kind of shocked um, for them to say it so candidly, and they will remain nameless because it, you could tell they, they meant it. And I think a lot of us are there. Acceptance. And that's when I went and hugged them. <laughs> You're great. I love you. Acceptance. All of us long for acceptance. We want to feel significant want to feel like, you know what, what we do matters and people do care. And, you know, we're on this earth for a very short amount of time. What difference do we make? We all long for our place in the world. So what I want to do today is I want to ask the question, why? Why did Adam and Eve do what they did? And you might know this moment in Scripture. we got to go back to the beginning. I really want to build some foundations here. I want, us to, I want us to really look at this Scripture, maybe with fresh eyes today, and go, wow, I can get a lot out of this. In my life today, this is applicable to me. Because why would Adam and Eve, why would they do what they did? Why would they have a place to belong They did not have to fight that insignificance. They did not have to fight this alone barrier. They didn't have to fight this barrier to communicate. Boy, they had innocence. They had intimacy, not only with God, but with each other. But why would they do what they did? Because of a free choice, there is right, there is wrong, there is good, and there is evil. And this moment in Scripture, I don't know why God allows this. I don't. Theologically, I can't say, wonder why God allowed this, other than to say, you know what, if we don't have a choice between right and wrong, that is not really a choice. And a deception occurs. A serpent shows up. We know this serpent as Satan. There is an enemy that wants to kill you, destroy you, rob you of your joy. There is a systematic cultural just crazy thing happening in our society where we sometimes don't believe that there is a satanic attack battling us and that there is, but yet God is greater, but yet we choose to digest the culture and the message more than we digest Christ and the cross. So I want to go back. I want to read for a while. I want to just get back into this, let this marinate a little bit so I didn't have too much information last week. But I want you to look at some things. Let's unpack these 13 verses of Scripture. I want to give you five things to think about because I think we're all there and we can relate to this way more than we think we can. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? We talked about this tree last week, this this place. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden of Eden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. The tree in the middle of the garden was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God put a tree in the middle of the garden, this place that he created for mankind, 
gave them a choice, so we're created in his image. He didn't put this tree behind barbed wire. They didn't have to climb a mountain. It was right there. They had everything they needed in life to sustain them forever and everything else. But of course, if it's forbidden, right, sometimes we roll that direction. But the serpent says to the woman, you're not going to die if you eat that. For God knows, this is a really interesting verse of Scripture we don't sometimes think about. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be enlightened. You'll see the light. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. At this moment in the infancy of man, they only knew good. They did not know evil. I want to unpack this verse of Scripture theologically for a minute because I think a lot of people go, oh, can't believe it, but Satan's going to use an innocent motive to really deceive Eve. And you will be like God. I don't know about you, but I want to be like God. Does anybody in this room want to be like God? I hope so. Why are you here? You're never more like God. I said it. When you live, you laugh, you love, you serve. I want to be more like God today than yesterday and a whole lot more like God tomorrow than today. I want to mirror the majesty of my maker. I'm created to worship God. I want to be like him in so many ways. I want to walk like Christ walked, love like Christ loved. Anybody want to be like God? What if God was one of I mean, right? Weird song. Innocent motive, the problem is, that's not exactly what Satan was saying, right? If you eat from this tree, you will become God. You realize that's where we are as a society, if you think about it astutely. Our culture was founded on Christian principles. Our our nation, America, was founded on principles to say, hey, we would like to conduct ourselves and be like God. We want to follow God's will and God's way. But there has been a problem, and we've seen it. It's been a slow fade. I don't think it was a happy days, just jump the shark moment. Dating myself, some of y'all remember, right, when Fonzie jumped the shark and the show was over. But I think we have a societal shift that we no longer want to be like God. We now want to be God. We don't need God. We have Google. We have a world that says, hey, I have all the information of the history of man in the palm of my hands. I don't really need God. I don't need that. We have a society that is feeding us, feeding us, feeding us this God-like complex, and we digest it every single day. And it started right here where the serpent is really beginning to kind of dig in. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, but also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and she ate it. Hence, at this moment, this is the downfall of mankind because of a woman. (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) It's right, Lou says, it's right there. But of course, she also gave it to her husband. He goes, okay. (laughs) Happy wife, happy life. Yes, I will. I'll take it. I'll eat it. (laughs) A little Fred Flintstone moment there. Gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes, we talked about this verse last week, the end of innocence. The eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves, Tarzan and Jane. The man and his wife heard. Listen to this. Listen how crazy this. They heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from God, like you can do that, among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to them, where are you? Adam answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. I now know the difference between right and wrong and I don't want to know this difference. I can't believe we're here. But boy, do I feel vulnerable. Boy, do I don't want to be exposed. And so I hid. 
We're there today. How many people struggle? And God said, uh, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I have commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me. <laughs> Don't you love the blame game? She did it. He wasn't complaining a few verses ago when they didn't have no fig leaves on. He's like, flesh of my flesh. Oh, woo -hoo. Now it's like, she did it. Some of you are there now. Like a couple years ago, you got married. It's all good. Now, she did it. Satan, right? I mean, that's the blame game. We do that today. Everybody blames everybody. Republicans blame Democrats. Democrat, Democrats blame Republicans. Husbands blame wives. Wives blame husbands. It is the government's fault, but it is. Anyway, I mean, we blame everybody. I said it, and I say it facetiously, and people laugh because there's a lot of truth to it because we blame our parents like crazy. If anything is wrong with me and you think, Brent, you have mentally gone way crazy, it's my mom. She pinned my diaper on too tight. She painted my color a lame yellow. She made me wear little knickers when I was a baby. Blame her. Her fault. We play the blame game. We still do it today. We don't take ownership. Then the Lord said to the woman, what have you done the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. But that's the truth. From that moment on, there is a choice to be made. And there is deception that is occurring, and we eat it every day. You're like, man, I wish God was, could walk and talk with me. We have his word. Our roadmap for living, Route 66 for our soul. An outrageous love story of a God who created all things and people walked away and God would love us. He could have deleted us off the screen a long time ago, but God loves you more than he loves. He, he loves us more than we love ourselves. And we have God's word and we can walk and talk and we can be in church and we can listen to the truth and we can have friendships and we have life groups right now that have been opened up. We have 500 plus people that have signed up for life groups and there's room for more. I mean, we're not meant to lone ranger and stay in dark places by ourselves. There's so many ways that we can encourage each other and lock in on God's promises. But yet the serpent, Satan, deceives us today and we eat it every single day and we wonder why we feel like we do. Why is life misfiring? Why is there no meaning? Why do I, I don't feel like I have a place in this world? I think, and this is what I'm going to give you, I wanted to give you five things, and it really comes from my life application Bible that as I was just studying one day, and of course God's word is so alive, it's just so alive. You might read something five years ago and you read something today and you're like, wow, I never got that, I never saw that. And in my life application Bible, there was a little part of it right here in Genesis 3 that it just says, hey man, Satan attacks even us today. And I really, I don't know, I gravitated to it and I think you will as well. Number one, how does the enemy deceive us today? And what do we eat? And boy, when we eat it, we struggle. Doubt, number one. I believe this is the assault of our society, questioning God's word and God's goodness. Christians today, there are some of you, and you might be in this room, and I just want you to think through this and listen to me, and hopefully you hear my passion, and you can research on your own, but you, you're going to live by faith. Remember that. You will live by faith. You're like, no, I don't live by faith. I, I put my trust in science. You're living by faith. That changes today from yesterday and tomorrow from today. Everyone lives by faith. What will you put your faith and trust in? This is huge, even in the life of the church. Standards that we used to go, wait a minute, we know that's right, we know that's wrong, has all been thrown away. Everybody gets that, right? Creation. We have evolutionist Christians. Well, we've evolved. Then how does life have meaning? How do you make sense of life? that the enemy would love to teach and really preach at you and let you consume, you're just an accident. You're nothing. Who cares about you? Screw up your life. What does anyone care? No one cares. God does. And we don't get that. We question God's goodness. We doubt all day long. 
We look at a world and go, God, how would you allow things to happen? God gave us a choice. We live in a world of sin, death, and disease, and we can choose to trust God. And not only did he create us, Jesus Christ is preparing a place for us that we will spend eternity with God and worship him in eternity. Compared to this earth, eternity is a long time. Discouragement. We look at problems rather than God. This is us. I just wonder if it's you. I know it's me sometimes. I can easily look at problems rather than God. I can easily get discouraged. I talk to you about anxiety. We talk about all the things that we all struggle with that's off the charts today. And we wonder why. Because we look at our problems, we look at our problems, we look at our problems rather than God. I think this one's pretty crafty. Diversion. Today, wrong things look attractive to us. Isn't it interesting that it does? Wrong things. It's easy to do the wrong thing, isn't it? Man, it just feels natural. Just walking that way. We want them more than we want the right things. Who cares about the consequences? Diversion. The word divert. Turning something aside from its original course. Anybody ever been on an airplane and got, that got diverted? I got a couple great stories. I have a nephew that's, he's an awesome kid, man, but he's out there. He got on an Allegiant flight from St. Pete Clearwater flying up here to see us in Tennessee, and apparently he fell asleep. Thunderstorm was in East Tennessee. Plane got diverted to Louisville, Kentucky. He woke up, totally oblivious to the world, walked outside the airport, was on the phone with us. He's like, I don't see your car. I'm like, what are you talking about, Connor? It's like, I don't see it anywhere. And then he goes, oh, wait, I'm in Louisville. Sorry. I almost got left. God bless him. My son and, and his friend uh, Briggs, we were on a flight to Denver, Colorado a few years ago. And it was a woman pilot, and she came on. She goes, man, Denver right now has a lot of wind shear, and, it, you know, the Rocky Mountains are there, and it's bad. And she goes, I'm going to try to land this plane. I'm like, what do you mean you're going to try to land this plane? She goes, hold on. And, I mean, she dropped the hammer into Denver, and the plane started to shake, and it turned sideways. She was ready to hit the ground. We're like, what is going on? I'm like, Lord, I'm coming home. And all of a sudden, she pulls that yoke back, takes off like a fighter jet. She swings back around. I mean, the place, everybody's puking. I mean, it is bad. She goes, we're trying again. She tried three times. And the last time she goes, if I don't get in this time, we're going to have to divert. I'm like, where are you diverting from Denver, Colorado? Des Moines? I mean, where are we going? She landed that plane. People were, I mean, sick as a dog. We're all kissing the tar. I mean, it was amazing. And I thought to myself, wow, I was more worried about being diverted. And I think there's a lot of people like that. You're like, you know what? Storms in life come. Turbulence comes in a marriage, in relationships, in a job. We're like, we'll just divert. Even though I kind of know this is where I need to go and this is where I need to be walking, whether it's in church life, your Christian life, whatever, you can put a lot of things in that equation. We start, well, wrong things look good. We, let's just move on. And it goes to this, defeat. You feel like a failure. So you just stop trying. How many marriages that I've seen, I mean, over the course of time in this last couple of years, it started to really expose a lot of, Ooh, we live in the darkest of days and people are like, you know what, I'm just going to quit trying. Goodness. It's easy for the enemy to get us in a corner and we just quit trying. And we could just be one moment away, one decision, one walk, one step away. So in your doubt, remember, got this shirt from a long time ago. Keep on walking. Do it. Delay. Don't put off something so it never gets done. I think that's the enemy's a tactic if we don't watch it even in the church today. You know, the old adage, if you wait for the perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. There are churches in America today that communities are counting on them, but they've been closed for a long time, and now we have a new variant comes out. And we're like, well, shut it down again. We'll, give it a, we'll, we'll take another pass at it in a year or so. Spiritual rhythm has been destroyed. People are lost they are consuming the culture as fast as they can consume it, and they wonder why there's a massive hole in their lives. Remember this. Jesus took our place, so we know our place in this world. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, I live, hey, I live by faith. But where do I put my faith? In the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to close with this. Tuesday night in this room, 
we had a funeral of a lady named Debbie. She was 54 years old. She died of cancer. Her and her husband, Gary, had been coming to the church for four years. My assistant, Becky, who was on the stage a while ago, um, any funeral that I do, I will ask her to reach out to a family member or loved one and just make sure that I have information that's maybe not just in the obituary about the person. I want to know that person. I love to honor life. And a lot of times, family members will send bullet points. Uncle Ed loved to fish, loved to hunt. He was a great antiquer. And I'll try to find a common denominator that we can kind of relate to. And I just love to honor life. I love to remember a life that was lived. We're all fearfully and wonderfully made. But Gary wrote me two pages about his wife, Debbie. And honestly, I've never had in in 30 years of ministry next year, lots of funerals, way more than I can name. I've never had somebody that wrote me something about his wife that was not intended to be read. He did not speak at the funeral. He just wrote this from his heart so he would know that I knew what she meant to him. I want to read you the last two paragraphs because I think it brings everything home. I sat at my desk and cried like a baby. I thought, wow, boy, that's living out this verse of scripture. People would often ask me to describe my wife and I would say this, we know that God is love. So he took all this love, added compassion, caring, kindness, and wrapped it into a beautiful package and she was named Debbie. She never had to force love, care, compassion, or taking care of people. It was just built into her DNA. It oozed from her pores. She was so unaware of how many lives she touched and affected. She never wanted the spotlight. She was very content staying in the background, taking care of people. She was the most genuine, loving, kind, caring, compassionate person I knew. She loved Jesus. She loved me. She loved her family. She loved her friends. She loved her church. Through the last two years in her battle with cancer, she never lost hope. She did ask the question, why me? But knew that God would be glorified no matter the outcome. In 2019, when she lost her hair due to chemotherapy treatments, she was so so afraid to show her bald head. But Pastor Brent preached a message that Mother's Day called Beautiful. The very next week, we're sitting in the church parking lot. All of a sudden, before we came into church, she took her hat off, threw it in the back seat, and said, I'm done. I questioned her and she asked, I don't care who sees me anymore. I'm beautiful. She was ready to hashtag kick cancer in the face, she said. Although the battle kept going and getting tougher, Debbie kept smiling, kept hoping. And to her very last day, I truly believe she knew that God was in control. I sat at my desk and cried like a baby. I asked God to forgive me all the times that I feel so doubtful, so discouraged. God, thank you that you are in control. Debbie lived out that verse of scripture. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And Debbie's in heaven today, not because she was great, because in May of 1999, she accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of her life. And today she has found her place in eternity. When you die, can somebody say something like that about you? Man, I hope so. God, be with us as we leave this place. May something I said today strike a chord in all of us because I believe that you are speaking. You've definitely spoken to me. And sometimes I think we just look at our problems way more than the promises that you have given to us. Oh, what a savior. Aren't you wonderful? Christ would die on a cross, would rise again for our sins, to conquer the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He is preparing a place for us today. Our hope, our anchor is secure, even in the midst of a storm. And yet most of us in this room, if we were honest, we're like, Brent, you're right. We digest the culture all of the time. And we come here sometimes and we're so weak, 
we're so feeble. Maybe we need to digest your word and your promise. Maybe we need to once again just be grateful that Christ, he took our place, that we know our place, and that's in you. God, thank you for this hour. Thank you for this truth. In Jesus' name we pray.